confusion. I will say, and I know many of you agree with this, there is a lot of confusion regarding the GMO debate. I mean, you think about it. I'm asking you, I, do you think that GMO modified foods are safe for consumption? Are they the answer to the malnourishment we're seeing throughout the world? And, you know, I am fortunate today to have two amazing men with me. Uh, the first is Dr. Brian Clement. Dr. Clement is author of the best-selling book, Living Foods for Optimal Health, and he is co-director of the Hippocrates Health Institute in South Florida. We are also fortunate to have international best-selling author and consumer advocate Jeffrey Smith with us. Mr. Smith is founder of IRT. IRT is the Institute for Responsible Technology and he has been instrumental in improving government policies and also influencing consumer buying decisions. I want to welcome you both. Nice to be with you. Thank well, you. Well, thank you. You know what? I, I think I'd like to start with that. You know, the, the mass production of foods. I mean, there's a lot of people who support GMO modified foods as saying that there is more food to feed hungry mouths. Do you agree with that? I mean, what, what, are, what are your opinions? Well, you don't have to have an opinion on that. You can just look at the independent research on yield. Uh, which is revealed both to the United States Department of Agriculture and the group Union of Concerned Scientists, and most recently another study, showing that GMOs do not increase average yield. Uh, and the world's experts at feeding the hungry world uh, uh, amassed a 2,500-page report some years ago sponsored by the United Nations and the World Bank called the ISTAD report, and it was how to feed the world in the future. Over 400 scientists contributed and they agreed that GMOs have nothing to offer the feeding the world, eradicating poverty, or creating sustainable agriculture. They, they projected that agroecology, like an organic agriculture, is absolutely appropriate. And yet the biotech industry continues to spin the truth and continues to pretend that GMOs are needed to feed the hungry world so that we in the developed countries will feel guilty by standing up and saying that this should never have been introduced. Oh, that's interesting. And, and Dr. Clemens, how about you? What do you think of that? Be, you know, it's funny because I was on the line with a, a person who was supporting GMOs, and he was talking about the quality of the soil and erosion and the, the fact that they, they could grow more products and feed more people. I understand, uh, Mr. Smith, what you're talking about. Uh, Dr. Clemens, what do you think? Well, I think uh, that the data is the data. Yes. Science is science. And I think that somebody that would advocate the use of GMOs, which I see in my daily work to be a health destroyer, and we can absolutely name diseases that didn't exist until people started to create a, a liking for GMO foods. Uh, it's insane to think that. Right. Another way to look at this is, is we are paying farmers in the developed world not to grow food. So for us to have starvation, it's a political decision to have starvation. We literally, in the developed countries like Germany, like France, like Canada, like the United States, literally subsidize food to keep it low and pay millions and millions and millions of dollars to farmers not to grow enough food. So the agriculture that we have today, the meat and dairy agriculture, is the number one cause for starvation and degradation of the soil. It is not what you suspect it is. Ah. It's something to do with genetic modification. Almost all greenhouse gases and all of the problems that we face with our environment of significance today come because people choose to eat animals and consume milk from them. Okay. For example, you know, the water crises in California, they talk about almonds, like almonds are the big deal. I mean, almonds take too much water as far as I'm concerned, but meat takes 2,000 times more water uh, to produce one pound of meat than an almond would do. Right, right. You know, it, it's interesting because I did a little experiment of my own with my own food, and I have three children, and just with the GMO debate, I took the way that I was eating, it just normally, and then I switched to all raw foods, and I really, I was looking at Hippocrates' mission and, and the, the background behind what the two of you do, and you say that food is medicine. 
And I will tell you that when I did that little experiment and I switched to raw foods, can I tell you that I had less joint aches and all my energy was so much higher. So I do understand what you're saying with the, the uh, food is medicine. GMOs, do they get in the way? What do they do to that quality of food? Is it medicine still or does, is it altered to the point where it doesn't have that effect? Well, when you genetically engineer a crop, you create massive collateral damage in the DNA, which can change what genes are expressed and how much of them. So in Monsanto's corn, which is engineered to produce a toxic insecticide, which breaks open the stomach of insects to kill them and can poke holes in human cells, it also has a gene that was accidentally switched on that produces an allergen. In Monsanto's soybean, which was designed to withstand sprays of Roundup, which gets absorbed into the soybean, which we eat, which is very dangerous. It also has as much as seven times the amount of a known soy allergen called trypsin inhibitor. So yes, there's dramatic changes in the background noise of the process of genetic engineering. And then, of course, you have these two toxins. You have the Bt toxin produced by corn, which kills insects, which can potentially poke holes in our in the walls of our, of our intestines. And then you have the Roundup Ready crop varieties, which is over 80% of all the GMOs in the world, designed by Monsanto to be sprayed with their herbicide, Roundup. And that in itself is quite dangerous because Roundup and its active ingredient glyphosate are probable human carcinogen, according to the World Health Organization. They lead to birth defects, they're endocrine disruptors, they're a patented antibiotic, so it can kill the gut bacteria. It can damage the mitochondria, which can lead to that brain fog and low energy. It also blocks key pathways. It can produce the important neurotransmitters like serotonin. It also can block the detoxification of the liver. So if you look at what it does, it basically takes virtually every system and every organ and messes it up. That's a technical term. <laughs> ah, I like that term. I mean, that's something we can all relate to. It, it, it's, it, it's true. You know, it's funny because I was talking with some of the uh, people who, again, support GMOs. And speaking to that issue, what they were telling me is that because the plants are modified to be less resistant to insects, they don't need all those herbicides and pesticides and all of that. And that's what I was told. And, and again, I'm just putting it out to you. Um, and I understand what you just said. Can you comment on that? Sure. Um... The herbicide-tolerant crops have resulted in an increase in herbicide use in the first 16 years of GMOs by more than half a billion pounds. The insecticidal corn has resulted in quite a bit less decrease in the spraying of insecticides. So it's true that the insecticidal corn and cotton is sprayed on average less often. However, okay. when you look at the whole picture, they don't count the fact that the corn and cotton itself is producing an insecticide far more than the amount that it displaces. So there can be 12 times the amount of insecticide in the acre compared to what it was before because they're ignoring the pesticide produced in the plant. They also coat the seeds with another insecticide which can cause colony collapse disorder and they don't look at that either. So by narrowing what they look at, they can pretend that it reduces the burden of insecticide, where in fact it can increase it many fold. So this is called reduction science, where they okay. basically, they tailor their outcome. And you know, where I sit, dealing with people who are very sick and often dying, there's diseases that exist today that were virtually non-existent 20 years ago. Uh, what Jeffrey just explained about preparations of the intestinal tract is called irritable bowel syndrome. I believe many diagnosed with colitis and diverticulosis, diverticulitis. These are all a resulting effect of these incredibly strange concoctions, Frankenstein concoctions, that I think harebrained scientists and profiteers from Monsanto and other companies are precipitating upon the, uh, on the public. I'd like to follow up and say, sure. I've, I've asked audiences in over 125 lectures what disorders and symptoms have improved in you when you switched to non-GMO or organic? And then I surveyed 3,600 people who all got better when they switched to non-GMO organic. And the number one in every lecture and in the survey is always gastrointestinal, including inflammatory bowel, irritable bowel, Crohn's disease, etc. The number two is increased energy. 
which you experienced yourself? Yes, I did. Oh. Actually, the GI, the GI uh, symptoms um, I was having too. I mean, I did. I had some of that, and I everything's great. So I I understand what you're saying. And the third was ability to lose weight spontaneously. The fourth was brain fog, and then there was things like allergies, skin conditions, anxiety, hormonal problems, depression, uh, and we see even autistic symptoms going away. In my new film called Secret Ingredients, which is just finishing up this summer, we have three autistic kids whose families switched to oral organic. Two autistic children are no longer considered autistic. They've lost their diagnosis. The third was switched from a special ed school to a public school because he improved so much. And we have 77 women in a clinic, out of 77, that when they switch to organic, these infertile couples, infertile women, got pregnant and had children. That's incredible. That's incredible. So for our people out there who are not really aware of the GMOs and they don't know what they're eating, can you maybe list the top, oh, I don't know, three symptoms that GMOs might cause in them that they may not be aware of, that you can draw to their attention? Well, actually, we showed a chart last night in a lecture here at Hippocrates yes. with about 25 different wow. diseases that were on the rise in parallel with the same, in the same slope exactly of the chart of the increase of the use of GMOs at Roundup. And this included autism, diabetes, several types of cancer, inflammatory bowel, uh, deaths from senile dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, intestinal infection, and stroke, um, even vitamin D deficiency, ADHD, anemia, schizophrenia. Because if you look at the mechanism of how the active ingredient in Roundup blocks the availability of key minerals, shuts down pathways, messes up the endocrine system, is a probable human carcinogen, is an antibiotic, is a mitochondrial toxin, it's like this cocktail that is like the perfect storm of disabling. And it really depends, and I'm sure Brian would agree, on someone's genetic disposition and other um, immunity. Uh, immunity and other aspects as to how that person is going to be affected when they eat a GMO or something that's been sprayed with Roundup. So it really varies on the person. Yeah, I mean, to, right. to it clear for your listening audience, nobody would drive into a Home Depot or a Lowe's and buy an insecticide called Roundup and eat it and expect not to die. Or oh my goodness, it makes me ill just thinking about that. <laughs> You're literally driving into your large supermarkets and taking the same exact thing just because it's not labeled, it has the same effect. So why would it not cause cancer and autism and neurological problems and gastrointestinal problems? Right. You would expect that and anticipate that if you took Roundup. Absolutely. So let's talk, you know, because there are a lot of people who will be listening to this interview and watching the interview. Let's talk science, scientific studies, because a lot of the people who are watching this are going to want to know the facts. Uh, so what how many, can, you, how many hours do you have? <laughs> <laughs> I have as long as you want. <laughs> uh, maybe your top, your top couple studies that we can, can look into or, or uh, see where what you're saying is backed up by that science. Okay, I did a book called Genetic Roulette, The Documented Health Risks of Genetically Engineered Foods, which had over 1,100 endnotes. But to pick out the, the most... Explain what an endnote is. An endnote, the, the references. Um, studies. Studies. Um, so I, I would say there was, a, there was a group in France led by Dr. Seralini, and they looked at 19 animal feeding studies on GMOs and found signs of toxicity in the liver and kidneys in all of those studies. They took one of the studies from Monsanto uh, with their Roundup ready corn, designed to be sprayed with Roundup, fed it to rats. Monsanto stops after 90 days and pretends that nothing happened to the rats, even though Seralini's team reanalyzed the raw data and found more than 50 parameters that were statistically significantly different. And he extended that study to the lifetime of a rat for two years. The next 30-day period, they started to get tumors. And by the end of the two years, those that were fed the GMOs had multiple massive tumors, early death, organ damage, and hormonal problems. Now, he also took a group and fed them the Roundup Ready corn that had never been sprayed with Roundup, they had the same problem. Right. He fed another group the Roundup in the drinking water without the corn, they had the same problems. So whether it was Roundup alone, the corn alone, or how it's normally eaten, the two in combination, 
It was multiple massive tumors, early death, and organ damage. A follow-up study looked at the tissues of the liver and kidneys that were of these animals that were fed tiny amounts of Roundup, 14,000 times lower than the amount allowed in U.S. drinking water by the EPA, and found clear evidence that the liver and kidneys were damaged because of the Roundup. So this is not, mm -hmm. this is hard science. Now, if you look at the biotech industry, and part of my last book has 41 pages, demonstrating how they use tobacco science. They rig their research to avoid finding problems. And if they find problems, they explain it away with completely unscientific excuses that just cause other independent scientists to pull their hair out and say, this isn't science. So what I've been doing for 20 years is interviewing scientists and translating it into English, both in terms of the evidence of harm and the devious ways that the biotech industry keeps their their data hidden and keeps their conclusions false. That is interesting. So, so let me ask you, out of all those studies, so that's fascinating to me. Is there, to your knowledge, any, has it been analyzed, is there any communities or societies in the world who are not affected by the GMOs and compare that to the disease rates, for example, in the United States versus those communities? You know, I've asked the people doing these epidemiological studies just that same question. Really? Okay. That's the question. And I said, what about Europe? And they said, no, because they use animal feed that's genetically engineered, and the Roundup active ingredient glyphosate ends up in their food supply, and they confirm that because in urine tests, even city dwellers in Europe have Roundup in their urine. Well, I, let's slow that down so they understand. In Europe, they've made a conscious decision in all the countries not to buy genetically modified food from the United States. Okay. What Jeffrey's saying is it snuck in anyway because we feed the overwhelming amount of grains not to humans but to animals and okay. that's what sneaks in. Now interesting Russia and Putin of all people is now discussing having a Roundup free GMO free country. Wow, that's interesting, isn't it? Exactly yeah. what's happening everywhere else. They right. banned the planting of GMOs and are making it a, a strong penalty if you plant GMOs, and they're banning the imports of some products that are contained GMOs as well. Right, right. Well, that actually brings up another question, and I'm almost afraid to ask it. <laughs> but let's switch gears to politics. Uh, now, are the, are the dangers of GMOs open for everyone to view, or are they being... I don't know, almost covered over with a rug, I mean, so that we're, we're not seeing what they truly are. Whitewash, whitewash. Not whitewash. The rug. Yes. It's actually worse. I mean, covered over is one thing, but it's actual Very. Yeah. It's what? I'm sorry? Very. So, oh, So okay. let me explain. I'll give you a perfect example. Um, the FDA's policy is that since GMOs are not really different than non-GMOs, not a single safety study is necessary, no labeling is necessary, and companies like Monsanto, the big GMO company, can determine on their own whether their GMOs are safe without even telling the government or the, or the consumer, even though Monsanto was, was caught lying about the safety of other products in the past. Now, that policy was created by Michael Taylor in the 19, early 1990s, 1992, when, as he was the director of policy for the FDA. That position was created for him specifically because the White House told the FDA to promote GMOs and Michael Taylor was Monsanto's former attorney. So he went from Monsanto's law firm, became in charge of policy at the FDA, allowed them on their market without any safety studies, then became Monsanto's vice president. Now he's back at the FDA as the U.S. Food Czar. Okay. Nine years or seven years later, a lawsuit forced the FDA to reveal 44,000 secret internal memos and then we discovered the fraud. The overwhelming consensus among the scientists working at the FDA was exactly the opposite as Taylor's policy. Oh, that's interesting. They, they said GMOs are different and dangerous and can lead to allergens, toxins, new diseases and nutritional problems, and that they should be tested carefully and there should be human testing. Now that kind of infiltration and deception, as I've traveled to 42 countries speaking about GMOs, I see it in many countries where they take over a ministry, or they take over a committee, an approval committee, with the majority. And it's amazing when I speak to the minority, it's just they pull their hair out and say, I can't believe it. These people rubber stamp every application for GMOs. They never even read the adverse findings. They dismiss it offhand. And this is very, very serious and dangerous. You know, as a consumer, that makes me angry because my children and myself, obviously, are eating this. We have a right to know, don't you think? 
Oh, yes. You, you said the word consumer, and so let's even make you more angry, <laughs> listeners more angry. Uh, so that you know there is a multi-million dollar campaign to prevent Americans in this so-called free great nation that we live in from knowing that genetic modified elements are in your food. Vermont passed a law and there was a major campaign by the GMO industry to shut it down, to actually say when you vote, when people in the United States vote in a state like Vermont and decide that you want every single product marked if it has genetic modification in it or not, they wanted to say you can't do that. And they tried to pass a law on two occasions now that literally made that against the law. Oh. American citizens to basically say, we request to know what's in food. Where right. by, you have to put how much nutrition or sugar or fats in the food, but not genetic modification. We were lucky because Hippocrates uh, saw this coming 10 years ago. We've hired lobbyists. We've had lobbyists in Washington for a decade now. And we're very fortunate because our lobbyist, Beth Clay, was a woman who w wrote the Duche Act in the 1990s to protect Americans' rights for supplementation. So she's a major advocate, a major believer like you are in understanding and I hope the listeners are there today. Mm -hmm. And we single-handedly pretty much stopped them from winning. But we only won by one vote. One uh, vote. One vote. Yes. That's it. When we're, and that's in the Senate. So when we're sleeping one night uh, around Christmas, they'll probably try to railroad this thing through again. Then we'll lose the right in America, the free country of America, as we call it, uh, to know what we're eating. You know what? That's not right. And you, you know, um... <laughs> let's say what it is. This is criminal activity by sleazy people. Well, here's the thing. And I, I was on Hippocrates' website, and and your your tagline is is you're helping people help themselves. Am I right? Yeah. And um, that what you're just saying prevents us from helping ourselves. We 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 can't do that. And I, that's. It, they can't take that right away. <laughs> when you sit in my office and have to deal with three-year-old children with brain cancer mm. and children who can't eat because they're nauseous and they're bleeding from the intestinal tract and you know well and good that there's a very, very large possibility it's because of what we're discussing today, yes. it, it angers me. But right. my anger comes out in productivity and in action. And we must change the education. The man sitting next to me I'm convinced he, along with his allies, are going to reverse this entire issue. I'm positive that in America we are going to get to a point where the masses, already it's more than half the population, are going to say no to this insanity. So we're not the only thinking people, and I think at the end of the day, the great people in the United States and Canada and all over the world are going to wake up and see what has happened to them. And by the way, your government's in bed with the devil. Yeah. That's that's what it sounds like. Um, you know, I, and it's funny because when I was trying to, part of what you're saying rings true for me because when I was trying to get away from GMO-related foods, I have to tell you, when I went into the grocery store, I, I didn't know what to buy because some foods are labeled as non-GMO, but there are significantly other foods that I buy on a regular basis that have no labeling in with respect to that. So can you... For our listeners and, and viewers out there, what are your recommendations? When we walk through that grocery store, what should we be looking for if we want to steer away from that? Jeffrey is going to give you the good news now. Okay. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> so, first of all, um, before I give the really good news, I'll give the very uncomfortable news. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll end with the good news. How's that? <laughs> and that is, and that is, you see, Roundup is not only sprayed on Roundup ready crops, it's also sprayed on many other crops as a ripening agent just before harvest, so it gets into the food supply. It gets sprayed on wheat, barley, rye, rice, potatoes, sweet potatoes, sugar cane, sunflower, kiwi, grapes, etc. And so if you want to avoid Roundup, and we strongly recommend it, then non-GMO is not good enough. It's uh, better to go organic. Okay. Now, organic does not allow the intentional use of GMOs. Of course, there could be contamination from time to time, but organic would be the way to go. So I would suggest for you two things. One, look at your brands, and if it's not organic, switch to organic. And the second thing is take a journal. No, take notes and, find, and, and write down your energy level, your mood, your behavior, your health conditions, your sleep situation, and watch what happens over a week, second week, third week. If it's like many people that I talk to by the thousands, 
you will see amazing differences that will be worth the extra effort and expense to switch to organic. Now, if you can't get organic, at least get non-GMO. If you go to non-GMOshoppingguide.com, you'll see the tens of thousands of products that have been verified by the non-GMO project. Say that again. Non-GMO. Shoppingguide.com. Okay, that's a, that's a great resource. So if you go there, it'll help. Now, if, you, if you're going to be buying and you're eating milk, meat, and eggs, it, and it doesn't say organic, and it's not wild caught, and it's not 100% grass fed, it's, the, those animals are going to be fed GMOs. Okay. So that's an indirect way that you get it. If you're looking at packaged foods, 9 out of 10 packaged foods are going to have a derivative from soy, corn, sugar, cottonseed oil, or canola oil, or, a, or milk, meat, and egg. So you've got to look for non-GMO or organic on the packaged foods, or look at our list of at-risk ingredients, which are the list of the derivatives of particularly soy and corn because they're very extensive and under a lot of names, and then you can try to avoid that. So right. transition, if you can't find organic, the transition to the non-GMO may take a little time, but once you identify a brand that's non-GMO that you like, then stick with that. And of course, if you can find organic, that's the gold, that's the better standard. Right, right. One thing that hits home, I was watching, actually, I think you, you had a conference, a health conference, and the both of you were up on the stage, and I was, I, one thing that particularly stood out to me is you were talking about milk. <laughs> and my family, we go through gallons of milk a week. It's, it's incredible. And you were talking about how the cattle are fed these products, and then the hormones are in the milk, and they're metabolized, I guess, to a chemical that is linked to cancers like prostate and testicular cancer and breast cancer. And that, I mean, that's shocking to me. And, and we're feeding our children that. So IGF-1 is a that's what it was. insulin-like growth factor 1. It causes cells to multiply. So if you have a cancer or a potential for cancer, it might speed that up, and so it's linked as a cancer risk. Now, I was told by a former Monsanto scientist that three of his colleagues who were studying the milk from cows treated with Monsanto's bovine growth hormone actually stopped drinking milk after the research because there was IGF-1. <laughs> They, had, they said, well, only buy organic, and one actually bought his own cow. Um, the, wow. the, the issue is that you end up, it ends up increasing the IGF-1 in the milk, it increases the bovine growth hormone in the milk, it increases the antibiotic-resistant bacteria in the milk, it increases the pus in the milk, and it's so distasteful, especially to moms, that the, they're going for the milk that says no RBGH, or okay. better yet, no, or no RBST, or better yet, organic. <clears throat> And yes. that way they avoid that. If you go organic, you get another benefit, and that is that the cows are not fed genetically modified grains. Because a lot of cows are not just fed pasture, they're fed corn or soy, which are always genetically engineered. So, so you know in great part, the organic meat industry is a complete fraud. Mm. Uh, so that's been exposed. And okay. so, give an example with the cattle, they are in the same exact pens as all the other cattle for generally the last six months of their life, with very rare exceptions, being fed the same, given the antibiotics, well, but they self-monitor this. The other thing is transition your family off milk and dairy foods. Really? Okay. My book, uh, my, I've raised four children, I have six grandchildren, they have never consumed a drop of dairy food in their life. Most of the world's population do not consume dairy food. Remember. Asians do not consume dairy food. Uh, if you look at my book, Dairy Deception, where I focused on the latest research, this came out two years ago, uh, with dairy and eggs, uh, these are not human foods. These are not something that it has any health benefit. And by the way, the reverse. I have chapters on showing how it creates osteoporosis. How it literally, as Jeffrey just absolutely correctly said, these inflammatory markers are linked to prostate, breast cancer, and all other forms of cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, brain cancers. And so these are not things that we have opinions about. This is the overwhelming data and research from global, authentic uh, science today. Facts. Most yeah. science today is checkbook science. And that means somebody comes in and says, here's what I'm going to pay you, and here's what I want you to tell me. It's not they hand you a check and say, do good for humanity. That science virtually doesn't exist today. So everyone comes in with the outcome and the check. So right. you, as a sci quote scientist, uh, or 
parentheses prostitute better literally go along with that program or you're not going to be working in the scientific community. Right, right. Let me let me ask one other question, something that's on my mind. Um, talking again about milk, uh, the the cattle are fed the this uh, GMO related material. Uh, who is responsible for manufacturing that and getting it to the cattle? So the far, I guess the farmers buy that. Who who is the ultimate person uh, not, company that that provides that and these materials that ultimately lead to cancerous situations? Well, in terms of the food, the animal feed, uh, Monsanto, Dow, DuPont, Bayer, Syngenta, these are the five major GMO companies that's, that now own 60% or more of the seed supply. Okay. For, for soy, corn, cotton, canola, etc., the main GMOs, they own vast, far more than that. And so they have gotten 90 to 95% of all of the acreage in those crops genetically engineered. So if you're going to be, if you're a farmer and you're raising uh, dairy cows and you're going to be bringing in corn, you just get corn from the market and 95% of that corn will be genetically engineered. If you want to get the bovine growth hormone, that was sold by Monsanto to Elanco, Eli Lilly's veterinarian division, and you can get that from them, although most American dairies have stopped using it because consumers have said no. Uh, now, what's interesting is that Roundup is sprayed on most of this animal feed, Roundup blocks the absorption of minerals, and so you have mineral deficient grains, you have mineral deficient animals. When you have mineral deficient animals, they are sick, they are damaged, and so what they produce in terms of milk and meat is also damaged. Oh. They, die, they die younger, there's a lot of infertility, and we talked to a lot of veterinarians who are doing the laboratory tests confirming this. You know, a, a, a steer in nature, a cow in nature, used to last almost 20 years. Wow, oh, okay. Yeah, two and a half to three years, it's an exception. So they've shortened the lifespan by nine times or ten times. That's incredible. It, it, one thing, too, you mentioned Eli Lilly. Uh, don't they manufacture, uh, I guess, anti-breast cancer drugs? Yes, there's a campaign called Is Eli Lilly Milking Cancer? <laughs> oh. They sell genetically engineered bovine growth hormone, which increases IGF-1 in the milk, a major study showed that there's a seven-fold increase in the risk of breast cancer with high levels of women with high levels of IgF1. Say that again, loud and clear. All right. <laughs> so it's a beautiful milking cancer. It's a beautiful, beautiful market. Wow. Okay. No, I, I understand. You got it. Okay. All right. Well, for our viewers out there, if they want to learn more about what we're talking about today, or even to contact you all, attend your lectures, where, where can you direct them? Well, we'll start with the Hippocrates Institute website, and we're the oldest uh, complementary health center on the planet. This is our 60th anniversary, and people come here from all over the world, and many have disease, and many are smart, like Jeffrey, who comes here to prevent disease and premature aging. So you can get a hold of us at Hippocrates, H-I-P-P-O-C-R-A-T-E-S, H-I-P-P-O-C-R-A-T-E-S Institute, I-N-S-T-I-T-U-T-E dot org. We're a nonprofit. So Hippocrates Institute dot org. And you can look up, you know, decades of magazines and uh, research that we've done uh, since 1956. And you can come and join us here. And we have ongoing uh, information and data. For instance, last night our community got to hear Jeffrey. And we can also hear more about us on the real truth about health dot com. The Perfect. Okay. Health dot com. And um, I founded the Institute for Responsible Technology 13 years ago, and you can check out our website at responsibletechnology.org. We have a newsletter, speaker training, activist groups around the country, uh, lots of information there. You can also uh, eat healthier by going to non-gmoshoppingguide.com to watch the trailer of the movie that's going to be released sometime soon. Go to secretingredientsmovie.com and to watch the last movie that we released that's the most popular movie on GMOs in the world. It's called Genetic Roulette, The Gamble of Our Lives. Go to geneticroulettemovie.com. So responsibletechnology.org, non-gmoshoppingguide.com, 
Secret Ingredients Movie.com, Genetic Roulette Movie.com. And before we leave, I want Jeffrey to give the latest statistics so that you're all up. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. The we good news. We're going to get rid of GMOs. So two weeks ago, well, let me give the background. Okay. When there was enough coverage on the dangers of GMOs in Europe because of a food safety scandal and the gag order was left on a scientist back in 1999. The food companies said no more GMOs in Europe because the consumers didn't want them. But the same companies like Nestle's and Unilever and Burger King and whatever, they removed GMOs in Europe, continued to sell it to unsuspecting Americans who had never heard of it. Then we started educating people first about bovine growth hormone. That was kicked out of most dairies around 2008. Then the natural products industry consumers, they kicked it out of the natural products industry, GMOs, in 2013. Now we have Nestle's and, and General Mills and Post and, and Campbell's and Del Monte removing GMOs from some or all of their products, Hershey's. And so we declared two weeks ago that the tipping point of consumer rejection, which we saw so far in these other arenas, is underway in the United States. And that we expect very soon the rest of the food industry, which is quietly scrambling to find non gm right. sources, is going to eliminate GMOs. Okay. All right. That's, that's uh, definitely very promising. Well, I salute the both of you, and I, I certainly appreciate your time today in, in interviewing. And uh, we look forward to really investigating it further. We'll get this out to our viewers. Well, we appreciate you. Keep up your good work. Well, that's thank it. you. Our right. feeding. Yeah, I, I'm sorry? Safe eating. Oh, safe eating. Same to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. You take care. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.